Okay. Um, good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we have what promises to be quite an informative and engaging program for you this evening, featuring lawyer and author Ian Rosenberg and illustrator Mike Cavallero, here to talk about their new book, Free Speech Handbook, a practical framework for understanding our free speech protections. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first, though. To post a question at any point during the event, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of Free Speech Handbook, which, uh, by the way, as an additive incentive, uh, includes uh, some uh, great signed book plates with illustrations on them. So um, uh, Ian's a, a media lawyer with more than 20 years of experience, 18 of them as legal counsel for ABC News. He also teaches media law at Brooklyn College, and earlier this year came out with a book on the subject, The Fight for Free Speech. That book explained the complexities of our free speech protections and very helpfully put some key legal arguments in lay terms. Uh, but the graphic novel publisher, First Second Books, saw an opportunity to, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, to go even farther uh, with an illustrated version, a part of a new line of graphic volumes on civics issues that First Second has launched. Uh, Ian teamed with Mike, uh, who has worked in comics and animation for three decades, who provided a lot of terrific illustrations to help make the issue of free speech even more accessible and even entertaining. Uh, 10 concepts are covered in Ian and Mike's book, including such areas of protected speech as criticism of public figures, profanity and broadcasting, leaks of confidential information, and the line between parody and libel. Recent examples are cited to go along with each major concept. So are a number of past cases to show how legal precedents have been set. Take for instance, Colin Kaepernick's national, national anthem protest. It's tied to a 1935 case of Jehovah's Witness school children refusing to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Or the effort by Donald Trump's lawyer several years ago to block the CBS program 60 Minutes from broadcasting an interview with Stormy Daniels. That's tied to the Pentagon Papers case a half century ago which struck a decisive blow against censorship of the press. Publishers Weekly, in a review of Free Speech Handbook said, this informative and inspiring guide looks past free speech cliches to home in on how such rights are not chiseled in stone, but fought over on an ever shifting battlefield. Uh, Ian and Mike will be in conversation this evening with journalist Laura Whitus Munoz, who was a pioneering reporter for the Associated Press on immigration and, and the Latin American community in the United States before joining the Fusion Network in Miami, then ABC News. And earlier this year, uh, became deputy bureau chief in Washington for the Los Angeles Times. Her book several years ago, The Making of a Dream, told the stories of several young immigrants and their families who became advocates for immigration reform. So uh, Ian, Mike, and Laura, Screen is yours. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you so much and welcome to everyone. Thank you for tuning in tonight on this Friday night. I'm thrilled to be with Ian Rosenberg, uh, my former colleague and uh, Mike Caballano, who is um, an amazing graphic uh, artist as we have said. And I wanted to start off with asking you guys, first Ian, I know your job, we, we both care about the, uh, the um, freedom of the press and the First Amendment, that's why we do our jobs. That's why we've been in the business for so long. You, you're a little busy as uh, Assistant General Counsel at a major media and news organization. How did you decide that now was the time to write a book uh, about free speech and, and what prompted that? Well, thank you, Laura, and thank you, everyone, uh, Brad, and everyone at Politics and Prose for, for having us. Um, so I started thinking about uh, doing a book about free speech uh, around 2019, uh, 2018, uh, after the tragic shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And 
as my job as uh, for uh, ABC News as a lawyer for Nightline, I was reviewing a piece about the students turn, uh, turned activists, the March for Our Lives students. And um, I was talking with my kids about National School Walkout Day, and they had a lot of questions. They wanted to participate. They wanted to think about um, walking out of school to protest inaction on gun violence. And they wanted to know what their speech rights were and what would uh, the repercussions be. And sort of, you know, had a lot of great questions. Um, they were at the time about 10 and 12 um, about free speech issues. And I realized after, you know, 20 years of working as a media lawyer that having a conversation with them, that wisdom of the First Amendment law um, could be condensed without being dumbed down. Uh, and that so much of my job as a media lawyer, uh, as a teacher at Brooklyn College for uh, communications grad students uh, is about explaining the First Amendment to very smart people who are not lawyers. And so that was the idea to write a handbook um, that would give people uh, 10 um, of our most important uh, free speech rights, free press rights, by looking at contemporary questions, as Brad was saying, each chapter begins with a contemporary question uh, and then answers that question by telling the story of people fought for their rights uh, all the way up to the Supreme Court um, and then uh, generally had those rights vindicated. Um, and so it, it really came out of conversations with my kids uh, and it felt like with each passing um, day of working on the book, uh, the need for a free speech guide became more and more vital. And when you first heard the idea of doing a graphic novel, what did you, you know, what went through your head? I mean, this is pretty complicated stuff, even if you're trying to explain it in straight words, um, you know, turning it into comics is a whole different level. Well, thankfully I had an amazing um, partner in uh, Mike, um, but I actually think um, now that, um, now that I, I've seen uh, how beautifully the book turns out that uh, in many ways, a graphic novel is the perfect vehicle for talking about free speech rights because so many of the free um, expression uh, issues that we talk about in the book were really visual issues. Um, it's Mary Beth Tinker wearing a black armband uh, as a middle school student in Iowa during the Vietnam War to protest the dead on both sides. It's Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. It's um, a man um, wearing a jacket in the courthouse that says F the draft, except actually saying the F word. Um, so, so many, um, it's, it's uh, Julie Briskman, um, you know, flipping the bird at the president of the United States. So, so many of the speech rights um, are actually visual representations. Um, and on top of that, Mike's drawings really not only um, clarify and give a documentary feel um, to the images um, that we're talking about, but they also um, really enhance our understandings of metaphors that are really hard to visualize. Um, so Mike's version of what the marketplace of ideas uh, looks like, I think actually gives people a better sense of uh, what that legal concept means than just hearing it or reading it in words. So I'm, I want to jump to Mike in a moment, but one of the things that I found most interesting, I mean, as working in the business, you know, cases, Sullivan versus New York Times, Pentagon Papers, those are frequently mentioned, but you really seem to take this, this opportunity to revisit parts of history that have been lost and fascinating characters like Molly Steiner, the yeah. World War I protester um, who, you know, who's the dissent in her case ends up being one of the most uh, oft repeated <laughs> First Amendment quotes. And, and people like Robert Cohen, who, who was the uh, draft op op opponent who had the uh, shirt you just mentioned. And of course, Larry Flint, um, who we all know from Hustler, but you know, getting away from the sort of idealized version of him in the film um, and really getting a nuance. And I'm fascinated how you were able to get so much history in such a small space and um, in, in, in nuanced ways, I mean, understanding the way that Flint um, was championing free speech and parody, but at the same time, not glossing over the misogyny, really extreme misogyny with gang rapes and things that Hustler was doing. And for both of you, um, I'm curious, you know, was it, did you pick the cases first, obviously for you, and then did you then do the characters um, or were some of the characters that drove you to pick the cases? And Mike, for you, you know, how did you go about picking the characters and, and describing them, especially, you know, you have Molly in the 1920s with shades on. I'll try to find that, which um, I, I don't think is quite historically accurate, but definitely gives a sense um, of the type of person she was, if I can pull this up for everyone. So 
I'll start with you, Ian, and then Mike. Uh, yeah, well, so one of the, you know, I wanted to, um, I selected the cases based on what are the most pressing contemporary questions that we have? You know, can we protest the government? What does it mean um, for Colin Kaepernick to take a knee? What about um, social media? And, um, and is hate speech protected um, by the First Amendment? I, I wanted to go with the questions that I think people are asking on a, a regular basis. And then I used the Supreme Court uh, classic cases to answer those questions. And, and to be honest, the characters came out of my research after I made that decision. Um, so much of law school is just, and, and being a lawyer, is just knowing about the law, but that means knowing about what the decision was and, and maybe the reasoning of the cases um, uh, by the Supreme Court. It usually has very little to do with knowing about the lives of the people involved. But um, you know, one of the th many things I've learned from working with colleagues at Nightline is that no matter how serious the issue, um, you really need to have character-driven narratives. Um, and that what is what brings people in to um, wanting to read a story or wanting to pay attention um, to an important issue. So I was delighted uh, to learn. I knew nothing about Molly Steimer before um, I knew the Abrams case. And, you know, Molly isn't the name defendant, but I think she's the most fascinating person in that case, which begins the book. She's throwing out, as you say, these anti-war leaflets right here on the Lower East Side where I am today, uh, blocks away from me. Um, and, and, and then when talking about people like Larry Flint and Jerry Falwell, um, you know, I, I did not want to be such a First Amendment cheerleader that I was overlooking um, the dark elements, uh, to say the least, uh, of many of these um, people in these stories. I don't call them heroes because um, many of them are not heroic people, um, but they are free speech pioneers. So that's and a little bit fascinating the, the details you got about uh, Falwell and Flint ending up developing a friendship. I mean, that, 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 is, that is remarkable. And, and, and I never would have thought that I would be reading both um, Falwell and Flint's autobiographies. It was, a, it was only for the research for this book that brought me to those chapters. And here is the marketplace of ideas so, um, that you mentioned. And I think that's the, the one. Yeah. And um, Mike, how, you know, how did you go about trying to capture these characters. Some of them obviously are, you know, very much like Colin Kaepernick in, in the consciousness, but some, you know, very obscure. Well, you know, there's a straight up sort of research, um, you know, photo research angle to that. It, you know, it's, it's a very straightforward um, uh, effort there to just, you know, on my part to familiarize myself with, uh, what some of these people look like, uh, just you know, to create a visual representation. Ian was a huge help uh, with that because I found he he has some kind of treasure trove of uh, legal books or something that, um, you know, in some cases I scoured the internet for photos of some of these people and just there just aren't any. But Ian was able to to come up very quickly with with many of them, kind of like magic. So that actually answering that question. Um, really shifted our entire collaboration into a different level because frequently when I work on a, a book with even with an author once I get the manuscript I'm I'm kind of very insular and I, I just sort of uh, do my thing unless I, I have a question and um, looking uh, looking for that photo reference and finding that Ian had it and the internet did not um, kind of was the uh, you know kind of melted the ice in in a way because we didn't we didn't really know each other and it sort of got us uh, speaking to each other more regularly and in, exchanging ideas more regularly and that it was sort of the doorway that uh, created like a much larger collaboration than it might have been but after you know after getting some idea what these people look like you know one thing I found was that Ian's manuscript was so evocative uh, that it it uh, you know, he and I have discussed this, and even I think even when he didn't realize it, his his language really just evoked Im images to me, and and uh, really sort of dictated uh, how to present the characters. And then even even you know beyond uh, Ian's uh, writing uh, itself, what you find reading the book is how relatable these people are. You you can't help but um, feel like you knew someone like that uh, frequently, right? Th these are not 
typically extraordinary people. There are extraordinary circumstances. And so like when I think about Molly Steimer, because, you know, you brought her up, she was she was a uh, news to me and uh, became one of my favorite characters. Um, I really felt like I knew her. I really felt like I knew people like her. But she, she I so under I felt like I understood her so much that drawing her was it. it you just fall back on those familiar people that you know to fill in the gaps, you know, and, and, and it really kind of brings them to life. I don't want to do too many spoiler alerts, but this is also um, one of my favorite uh, pictures. I think I'm getting the right part of the hand punching through. And this is um, in the chapter um, on FCC and some, it starts with uh, Samantha B's uh, pretty strong insult of um, of, uh, I believe that's one, it starts with, yes, um, of Ivanka Trump, am I right, Ian? Yeah. Okay, and um, and then goes back in time to the draft and and sort of the different restrictions on the, um, on airwaves. And obviously a lot of these feel a little outdated today, but I love that picture, it was so powerful, so evocative. And I think that's really what Ian's getting at. And I wondered, how did that come to you? Again, it just, to me, it, I wish I had a better answer. It seems so obvious to me. Like, um, I, I think I often say, you know, uh, that uh, hearing something was like getting punched in the face. You know, I, mean, I see that all the time. So, um, you know, to me, uh, the imagery really just came out of the language of the book. It, you know, it really seemed to um, steer me. A lot of times I don't feel like I did anything. It just, it just was kind of already there on the page. I really wish I had a better answer than well, that. Mike is, that's is the truth. So, is so modest, but I, I will say that um, that's not language I can I can take credit for. That's Justice Stevens, um, you know, Justice Stevens, the, the the noted liberal justice who actually is quite conservative um, in the Pacifica case that Laura is talking about, um, which uh, involves George Carlin's um, you know seven uh, dirty words monologue and then his follow up monologue, filthy words. Um, and Stephen felt that the FCC should be allowed uh, to restrict, not censor, but restrict uh, even non-obscene language, uh, so indecent language, because uh, warnings weren't enough, because in his mind, um, radio um, saying that you should just put a warning at the beginning um, or that people could turn off uh, the radio or television was like saying that uh, you should deal with an assault, like a punch in the face um, by later uh, getting some type of warning. Um, so I think it's another amazing example of how, you know, that line in a Supreme Court opinion can sort of roll by, even if it's in a book and sort of highlighted, but Mike's illustrations make that come alive and make you really sort of think about what is it like um, to have, uh, for people who are really concerned about um, profane language, uh, to have something come out of your radio or television. For people who aren't studying the First Amendment and the Constitution all the time, I think um, one of the things that's very interesting in the book is, is the emphasis on the role of dissent over yes. time. And, um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, obviously, Oliver Wendell Holmes' dissent um, in the first case, uh, and, and that's where we come with the free, trade, the free trade of ideas that is the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself uh, in competition, and, and then how that becomes um, much later on something that's adopted but not initially. You know how how much was that um, something that you you know you see as sort of the through line and and looking today at some of the cases today that we're seeing dissent on. Uh, well, that, absolutely. I'm so glad you brought it up because it was definitely intentional that one of the uh, through lines of the book is that um, we need to protect dissent. The book is really more descriptive rather than prescriptive. Um, but at, at the end, I have a few maxims um, of what I think people should uh, take away from the book or, or at least when they're approaching First Amendment questions uh, to think about for themselves. And the very first um, maxim I have is to protect dissent. And, and I think um, one of the things that um, we sort of forget about is how unpopular dissent usually is at the time it happens. So now we look on um, Dr. King um, with sort of a reverential, justifiably reverential um, uh, view, but that was not the way he was viewed, even during the time of the March on Washington. 
Um, and so when people like Colin Kaepernick are attacked um, for their, um, you know, supposed lack of patriotism because they're dissenting um, from um, the mainstream, um, I think it's important to be reminded um, that even if people are saying something unpopular, that does not mean it is unpatriotic, um, and that the First Amendment is designed um, from its very beginning, starting in, in chapter one, where I talk about Molly Steimer and these, you know, what were considered very revolutionary anarchists in their day, um, all the way through uh, up to Colin Kaepernick and beyond, that, you um, that we need to protect um, unpopular viewpoints. And that is what, in my mind, um, our First Amendment is designed um, to do, that, that dissenters are at the center, not the periphery of the First Amendment. Right. And I think it's, is it a Barnett case where, you know, uh, Judge Robert Jackson, and this is a case of Jehovah Witnesses, kids who don't want to stand for uh, the pledge yeah. of allegiance. And he says those who begin cor the course of elimination of dissent soon find themselves exterminating the, the dissenters and that, you know, that finding those nuggets that you, you know, that are, you know, in, in all these opinions that we, you know, in the general public don't take all the time to read is just so powerful, I think, today, especially... I and Mike's image of the graveyard in, in that, um, uh, in that sequence um, is another, you know, another time when it's a great line from, from Justice Jackson, and, and I'm so glad you picked it out. It's one of my all-time favorites. Uh, when I teach my media class, uh, media law class, I sometimes say that uh, everything is my favorite, but that's that's probably one of my very favorites. <laughs> um, and I think it's so much more powerful seeing the way um, Mike has has brought it to life, or um, in, in terms of a graveyard um, <laughs> showcasing the death. But in terms of dissent, not just protecting the dissenters, but also the role of the dissent even in the in the Supreme Court. And uh, yes, absolutely. One of the, obviously the, the market of ideas is a big part of, of the book, um, but you also acknowledge the imperfection of the market of ideas and the voices that for so long women, people of color, um, others who have, who have not had their voices heard. And of course, now we get into a moment where the amount of money pouring in, um, you know, into the uh, media landscape and, um, and the social media, you know, is the, is the, is the playing ground a place where we can still have that uh, have that market? Does it um, play? And I know you're you're. Um, well, you talk about it in the book, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, so I, I have two thoughts. I, I, on the one hand. Um, you know, I, I don't want to be such a First Amendment uh, or um, a champion of, of the status quo that I, I look at things uncritically. I think too many First Amendment books in the past sort of say that this is the way the law is and this is the way the law always should be. And, and there's nothing really, um, uh, there's no really reasonable critiques. And I, and I certainly don't think that's the case. Um, you know, the marketplace of ideas has a lot of flaws and there are a lot of very smart um, very knowledgeable people, um, uh, knowledgeable of the law who have critiqued it in important ways, equity theorists like Catherine McKinnon or critical race theorists um, like Kimberly Crenshaw and others. Um, but um, I, I would, um, but I do in, in this case, I believe that the marketplace of ideas, even in today's market, um, still has a lot of value, that metaphor. And that's because of something else that Justice Holmes says in that opinion that's less focused on, which is that um, to paraphrase, he says that this is in any way, uh, at, at any rate, this is our constitution. It is an experiment as all life is an experiment. And, and just like with an experiment, you don't always get the right results. You might do an experiment and it doesn't work. You might get, uh, do an experiment and what you thought was true isn't true. Um, so I think it's less that the marketplace always works, e even in today's market. And it's that it's the best model we have um, to try and sort of experiment through the difficult um, combination of, of, of uh, competing factors, uh, competing viewpoints that we have in such a diverse uh, country as we do. In terms of um, one of the cases that that is toward the end of the book um, with the funeral of um, the military soldier and, uh, and sort of the, the notion of uh, as you're saying, protect, you know, protecting the speech, protecting the marketplace of ideas, including what we call hate speech, um, but, and the attacking also of individuals. And I was really struck by some of the tension with uh, Justice Alito's argument that if there is, you know, that you can't hide um, sort of, that attacks against individuals, if mixed with the, you know, the public, dis something of public discourse and of public interest, isn't um, sufficient, and then obviously the court ruled 
in either direction. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that because there is sort of, I think a lot of people have the notion that at a certain point, you know, especially as we get into places like Twitter where you have sort of mob attacks and things like that, that there, that there is a line that can be crossed, but obviously again, the balance. Yes, so, um, so Laura's talking about um, the Snyder case, which uh, involves the very hateful Westboro Baptist Church who used to protest outside of military funerals because in their uh, mistaken um, belief that it was God's punishment um, for America's, in, in their mind, over acceptance of, of gay and LBGTQIA uh, rights. And, um, and, and, you know, Justice Roberts, for the majority of the court, uh, says that if there's any bedrock First Amendment principle, it's that we can't punish the speaker um, just because we hate their message. And that even an abhorrent um, protest of, uh, outside of uh, a funeral um, is protected. Um, so as you point out, Alito you know, says these, are, these messages um, weren't just about uh, you know, being against gay rights or, or being against um, uh, military policy, they were also uh, attacking the Snyder family. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's some factual problems with that. I mean, they didn't really actually write about the Snyder family that much, but, but, but putting um, that aside, um, I, I think that the, the, the difficulty is, um, unless you are um, targeting somebody individually in a way that is a, a actual threat, what, what's called the true threats doctrine, um, then that, um, which is a very complicated area of the law, which I don't talk about that much because it's the, the Supreme Court has been very contradictory about it over time. And I really tried to pick the cases where the court has been clear um, and there's uh, less um, sort of ifs, ands, or buts. But, um, but, the, but the line that I do believe makes some sense um, is that hate speech in general um, is protected, whereas individual uh, threats, uh, um, uh, particularly threats that might lead to violence against those individuals um, are a different story and that that is, is not protected by, this, by the First Amendment. I'm gonna uh, switch over to a couple questions we now have from the audience. Uh, so, I'll read the first, as you know, two justices, Thomas and Gorsuch, have called for the Supreme Court to reconsider New York Times versus Sullivan, the landmark 1964 ruling that made it uh, hard for public officials to prevail in libel suits. How worried are you about the courts reversing that uh, itself on this? Uh, well, so I, I, I had talked in the book, uh, I talk about um, the, the libel standard of Sullivan. Uh, I begin by talking about how Trump, you know, used to say over and over again that the media can lie and get away with it and there's nothing we can do. And uh, he's probably the only president in history that, you know, tried to make um, changing libel law a, a campaign issue. Um, and uh, that's just false. That's not what the standard is. Um, the media is not allowed to, to lie and get away with it. Um, and I do talk about how Justice Thomas has for a long time um, wanted uh, to change that. And then since the book ha has come out, Justice Gorsuch ha has also joined him on a sort of different tact. But, but um, thankfully, I, I think, uh, and there was recently just this term, uh, Floyd Abrams, who I talk about in the book, had an important editorial in the New York Times um, because the, the court could have taken up a, a libel case uh, that might have signaled uh, a change in their uh, support for the Sullivan um, doctrine um, and they, they declined to do so. So um, I'm, I'm not currently worried um, about a change um, in libel law, but I think what's more important um, and one of the other reasons why I wanted to, to write the book is that I am very concerned about um, uh, the attacks on the press, um, you know, having gone through a whole administration saying that the, the media is the enemy of the people um, and just a sort of increasing uh, disbelief in, in truth from, um, from experts. Um, so I, I am very worried um, to this day um, about uh, the way people view the media and, and their um, particularly on partisan lines, their lack of faith um, in the mainstream media. I, I work for the mainstream media, so I'm not objective, but I, but I can say that this is a real concern because I know how hard the people at ABC and other organizations work to um, tell the truth every day. Um, so I, I, I am, I'm not worried about the, the doctrine being overturned, but I am worried about public perception uh, of the media. And I hope uh, that the chapter on libel um, in Free Speech Handbook uh, clears that up and gives people a little bit more faith in, uh, in the fifth estate. Yes, and I'll get back to you because I know it'd be fun to talk about uh, malice, but, but, but let's um, just, I wanted to hop in with another question from the audience, which sort of gets to what I was talking about, about who's, um, whose ideas are heard in the, in the marketplace of ideas, but also the protections 
And this person says, for some the people these days, the First Amendment is seen as a document used all too often to protect offensive speech against marginalized groups. Arguments have been made to balance free speech principles against uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion considerations. What's your, what's your view? Uh, well, those are really important concerns. Um, and I think, again, I think too often um, First Amendment advocates have sort of dismissed uh, that um, plea from, from uh, minority groups um, uh, too cavalierly. Um, and again, there are you know, very smart people like uh, Marie Matsuda and others have said that we could carve out an exception um, to regulate hate speech for um, marginalized, um, historically discriminated against groups in, in different sophisticated ways. Um, but in, in short, um, one of the reasons why I wanted to do a historical overview of, of cases um, is that although it may feel today that um, often minorities are on the receiving end uh, of a lot of difficult speech, um, in the past, um, it has been very true that um, dissenting um, minority viewpoints, religious minorities, um, uh, you know, um, civil rights activists um, were real beneficiaries of um, the protections of the First Amendment. Um, and so I ultimately do on balance um, feel that we need to continue um, to protect dissent, um, even when it um, involves hateful attacks um, on some very vulnerable um, populations, because ultimately who, who is going to make that decision? I mean, during the Trump administration, I do not think we would have wanted, um, you know, liberals a, a, and minority groups would not have wanted uh, President Trump, who famously said that there were good people on both sides, um, and Charlottesville being the person who is determining what groups are protected, and, and perhaps conservatives feel that way uh, about the Biden administration. So I think the who decides question um, is really a, a very difficult hill to overcome. Are there cases, as, uh, this is from uh, Kristen uh, Harbison, are there cases being considered now or, or that have been decided since your manuscript was finished that you think are likely to be seminal decisions moving forward? Um, well, well, there's a sequel. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I'd love to do a sequel, but um, so there is one vitally important um, speech decision um, that just came down this last June, um, and that's called Mahonoy um, versus BL. The BL ended up um, being known later as, as Brandy Levy, and people might have heard of this case as the cursing uh, cheerleader on Snapchat. Um, she was a, a high school student who didn't make the team, and then on Snapchat sent a text to her or a Snapchat message um, to some friends that said, you know, F, you know, school, F cheerleading, F everybody, again, actually using the F word. Um, and uh, she got suspended from the team. Um, and uh, because of the Tinker case, um, Mary Beth Tinker, who I alluded to before, um, because of the Tinker case that I explain in the book, um, uh, she um, had her, believed her rights um, were being violated, that she had a speech, uh, free speech right. Um, Tinker was protesting during school. Um, Brandy Levy was protesting on the weekend at the mall um, on social media in no way uh, during school. And the court um, made a really strong, um, the strongest reaffirmation of student speech rights that they've made since the Tinker case, um, uh, just as I said, just this June. But what, so while that's a, a really important decision, um, what, I, what I want people um, to take away from that, besides the importance of student speech rights, is that I think that Free Speech Handbook gives you a framework um, for understanding every case that will happen um, since uh, the book is published. Um, because not only are, are many of the chapters about seminal cases that will come up in these new cases, but it also just gives you a way of thinking about, all right, so is this case like another case or is this case like the rights described in this case? And that's the nature of the law. And I, I, I'm trying to sort of sneak in that legal method um, by the way we structured the book. So I'm going to pop in a question for Mike um, here. Making comments, uh, this is, I think, Dean Haspiel. Uh, making comics often requires a certain kind of visual shorthand. And can you please talk about the process you went through in arriving at your visual style for free speech? Well, there was an imperative, I think, at the beginning before we really even started working uh, to get the book out. Uh, it wasn't so much a, a hurry up as a, uh, you know, there, it is kind of a timely book. And um, I think what we wanted to do was come up with a visual language that um, felt spontaneous um, and that allowed um, Ian's narrative to sort of take the four. So um, something that felt uh, uh, brisk, 
and uh, visually uh, unlabored, you know, is what we were looking for. Um, and, you know, I, I fell back on a number of things. I had, I, in the first place, I had spent a few years doing um, a pharmaceutical uh, whiteboard uh, explainer videos. And in those cases, uh, we, we were often dealing with, um, uh, you know, science and, uh, uh, science and language that uh, wasn't very visual. So we had to come up with metaphors to really communicate uh, some ideas that were, are kind of hard to wrap your head around. And um, so uh, working metaphorically kind of really factored into this book. And uh, in, in terms of coming up with a style that was, uh, like I'm saying, just sort of uh, uh, brisk and, and unlabored, uh, I just turned to some uh, cartooning greats as, as sort of a, a, a starting path, like a, a direction to head in. And, uh, you know, those were people like Sergio Aragones, who uh, is famous for Mad Magazine, but he has a very spontaneous, lively, unlabored uh, style. Um, another uh, illustrator named Paul Coco Jr., who uh, a lot of people don't know his name, but if you're my age, you, you grew up on Paul Coker Jr. Uh, cartoons and designs because he was uh, the principal designer on all the Rankin Bass animated features, a lot of holiday stuff like Frosty the Snowman, Rudolph the Reindeer, all that, all that animated stuff that we all watched. That's Paul Coker Jr. Uh, if, if you think of those uh, stop motion models, you might not get it, but if you see his actual line art, it's very loose and, and very evocative uh, and, and, and very brisk. Um, and another thing that we grew up on, if you're my age, was um, uh, Schoolhouse Rock, uh, which, you know, it, it's sort of like the gold standard for explaining, um, you know, com complex things in a way that oh, oh, anybody can understand. I'm so glad you and, um, bring that up because I, I kept thinking about Schoolhouse Rock when I was reading this, actually. So was I. <laughs> so was I. I'm glad I, I mean, you know, Right. Um, it, those really pointed away. So it, it, it was just the challenge was to take uh, what I needed from all those sort of, you know, stir those together and then combine them with my own sensibilities and, you know, my own way of uh, telling a story and, and to come up with something that was unique and that, that uh, became like a, a, a visual language, a, vis a, a visual vehicle to, you know, to just carry um, Ian's narrative. I think Mike, you've called it like graffiti or, or, or other style names before, which I've always liked. I, I kept calling it uh, cartoon graffiti or, or graffiti comics because I said I was running up to Ian's script, drawing something and running away quickly. Uh, which was somehow, uh, sometimes how, it, how the approach felt. So uh, actually just to follow up on that, one person wants to know, uh, just from a technical point of view, do you do completely digital? Do you actually use paper? Uh, on this, uh, I got away from using paper uh, a while ago. Uh, I've been completely digital uh, for a few years. I work mostly on an iPad. Um, iPad is great for comics, and um, I don't. I could. I don't think I could have done this particular uh, book on paper. Um, you know, one thing that will it will probably only resonate with if there's one or two artists listening. Uh, you know, part of the gauntlet that Mark Siegel, our editor, threw down uh, to me at the onset was not to do roughs, not to pencil. Uh, but to just go straight, uh, uh, straight ink, as it were, I mean, it's digital, but to just go straight from the script to the final drawings. And so that was, um, that is terrifying to most cartoonists. Uh, it was certainly not anything I'd ever attempted. Um, so I, I don't think, I, to me, doing that, you have to have a certain level of confidence and comfort and, and actually working digitally kind of provides that because in the back of your head, you know it's, it's not permanent. That, um, and it's all adjustable. And so that kind of puts you into this kind of uh, mental space where, where you can just sort of draw, you know? So um, it really was a very, I mean, I have been doing comics since 1991 and um, I've done a lot of 
comics. And uh, I've never approached a, um, a book this way before, but I, it was really just start drawing and then go to the next page. Uh, so it's, it's very spontaneous, it's, it's very loose, and it really is just like um, uh, this free, free, free floating, free translating um, Ian's uh, language and to just kind of distill that straight into imagery uh, at around five pages a day, which is, which is you know, fast for, for comics. Um, and uh, it was budding, really kind of a fascinating way to work. Go ahead, sorry. For the budding uh, artists in the room, any suggestions for um, easy to use programs? Uh, well, Photoshop is great. Um, I've been using a program called Clip Studio Paint uh, which is specifically designed to do comics uh, and uh, works great on the iPad. And I, I, I use Photoshop less and less and uh, Clip Studio is, um, it's great. If you're, if you're younger than me, I, I teach at the School of Visual Arts in New York and you know, my students are, they're, are they're juniors and seniors. And um, you know, if you're around that age, you, you know Clip Studio know. Paint very well. They're, they're all using it and um, it's a great program, yeah. And, and one thing I just want to say about um, Mike's style um, for this book, which is so remarkable, is that it's entirely different um, than the other styles uh, that Mike has uh, done in, in the many books he's worked on. Um, his amazing um, YA series, uh, Nico Bravo, uh, about the adventures, uh, mythological adventures of uh, a young guy. Um, it looks totally different. He uh, collaborated with the playwright uh, Adam Rapp on a book that I love called Decelerate uh, Blue, um, which is totally different. And his um, uh, sort of family story, um, uh, Parade with Fireworks, has another painterly uh, look to it entirely. So I, I encourage everyone to get all of Mike's other books uh, and you'll see how different um, they look and how he really picked a style for this material. It's not just the Cavallero style that uh, is imported every time. So getting back a little bit to the First Amendment, uh, just the issue of truth has become uh, so critical lately, given the many untruths that are being spread. Um, what, to what extent should the First Amendment be allowed to protect lies and intentional disinformation? And I was going to ask that same question. I'm thinking especially, uh, you know, some of the, um, the um, whistleblower information from Facebook and, and all of the mistruths, particularly in Spanish also, that were going on Facebook. Um, and then, you know, obviously all the, the things that, that are likely to be circulated as we um, head toward the 2022 midterms, how, you know, to what extent does it protect lies, but also in a place where the, you know, the spread, the, the pace is, is so exponentially greater than what Mark Twain ever could have imagined and, um, and the reach of the impact. Well, there's, so I, I address this somewhat in, in chapter 10 where, where I talk about, you know, Twain's line, does, does the truth ever uh, catch up with a lie? And Mike has some amazing um, tortoise and hare imagery to, to go with that. Um, the only uh, case that I would have maybe loved to have um, a, a addressed in addition, uh, perhaps for the sequel, um, is uh, something called the Stolen Valor Act um, cases, um, which involved Congress's efforts um, uh, to um, make it illegal to lie about your military record, which seems like uh, a virtuous goal. Uh, but the Supreme Court um, said uh, that the First Amendment protects untruths. Um, that uh, I, again, because we don't necessarily want the government uh, to be the arbiter of truth um, and that therefore um, actually falsehoods except for a limited exception in the trade context, so in commercial speech, but otherwise, um, there is a First Amendment right to lie. Um, and, and that is particularly disturbing uh, for the examples you raise and, and with you know, false information about, um, about vaccines or about the, the false information about um, uh, the lack of validity um, of our last presidential election, which is totally untrue. Um, so uh, there is a First Amendment right to lie. It, it is disturbing. Um, and, and the solution, which people might find uh, unsatisfying is again, the marketplace of ideas that we have to uh, all uh, engage in a commitment um, to try and um, put forth truth um, to counteract uh, speech that is not only bad, but false. 
Some people might argue that the um, that the founders never would have imagined a marketplace that is so uneven and, and the power dynamics are so stretched. Do you agree with that? Uh, not entirely, be, because um, I mean, first of all, because they were all white male property owners, so I, right. I think they, so they were. I think they were different. very comfortable with in, inequality yeah. in, in terms of uh, economic wealth. But um, but but more seriously, um, you know, the, the what uh, Justice Kennedy in the last chapter of the book. Um, uh, I talk about, um, or Justice Kennedy talks about how the social media today is a vital component of um, our ability to engage in free speech um, because of the vast democratic forums of the internet um, is a lovely phrase of his. Uh, and I think that one, there are many problems with social media, but one of the great equalizing forces uh, of it um, is that um, we no longer need to have a printing press or uh, a television station or um, a, a movie studio um, in order to be able to get our message across. And so um, regardless of, of whether the framers would have in, envisioned any of those things, um, I actually think that in many ways we are at a much more small d democratic state um, to our free speech world uh, than we were at the, at the time of the country's founding. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention one case that you don't include, but I think um, given that we're getting close to the anniversary of January 6th, the speech uh, by then President Donald Trump um, on the mall um, before the insurrection in the Capitol. And, you know, there have been, there's been a lot written about it, about, you know, in terms of it being protected speech, but I, I, I'm interested in sort of which of the cases, you know, that you would highlight if you were going to do a sequel. Well, um, I actually think that, I mean, I don't directly address that because it happened after the book came out, but I, but, but once again, uh, Free Speech Handbook uh, has your back. Um, and uh, <laughs> chapter one, um, where um, the, the case we're talking about Molly Steimer, I begin the contemporary issue uh, is Madonna saying, I've thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. And then she quickly says, but I know that we have to focus on love over hate. Um, President Trump, uh, former President Trump used, uh, his legal team used that um, example um, in, in trying to uh, defend him in, uh, in a second impeachment trial. Um, and there, um, you know, at the end of um, the Abrams case, um, that leads to the Brandenburg standard that we have today, which is that um, you basically are allowed to advocate for illegal action as long as it does not um, it, there's not a likelihood um, of imminent, um, uh, so both a likelihood um, and um, an imminent um, cause of illegal action. And I, I think it's a very, um, I think it's a very, you know, it's a very speech protective standard, which is a good thing. Um, but I personally think that um, Trump would lose under if he had been not impeachment, um, which is a, not a criminal proceeding in that way. But if he had been criminally prosecuted um, for incitement, I, I think he would have uh, very likely have lost because um, it was both um, likely um, to cause harm. It, it did cause uh, horrific harm, uh, the loss of life as well as the attack on the Capitol. Um, and I think that there was an, a, um, an intent um, uh, to make that um, uh, reprehensible action um, move forward. So. Um, even so though is, he said do it color. peacefully and you know uh, respectfully or whatever. Right. I mean, you know, the, you know, Trump's MO was to say one thing and then to say something else. And I, I think that that, you know, makes it a, a more perhaps complicated um, a criminal case. Um, I mean, the other thing, though, is um, that's un very unusual in that regard um, is that we um, I think we we most certainly take um, our elected leaders' words more seriously as we should um, than just say an anarchist on a street corner throwing out leaflets. So if anything, um, I, I, I think that the caveats are less effective um, when they're um, coming um, from somebody who has the power um, to, you know, uh, to launch war. Uh, so um, it, it's a, we could have a very fun hour discussion um, about the Brandenburg standard and how that applies to Trump. Um, but once again, um, read chapter one and uh, you'll be ready to have that discussion with anyone who uh, you want to engage with. And getting back to the limits on the, on the internet, uh, Texas Governor Greg Abbott's law to, um, you know, against what he called censorship by social media companies, um, for 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 blocking conservative voices that he wanted to um, penalize them, and that was had an injunction issued against the law. Um, do you see 
any place where some of those kinds of efforts uh, could gain ground? Or are you confident that they, uh, both on the left and the right in terms of limiting that kind of speech? Well, the, the left and the right I mean, element is, is very in, is very interesting. Um, so, so yeah, so the Texas law, you know, attempted out of a, a new conservative belief that social media companies have a bias against um, uh, against conservatives online, we tried to make it, uh, a, you know, a prohibit it um, from so social media companies to prohibit them um, from deplatforming or um, editing people's speech. However, as I point out in chapter ten. Um, uh, well, two things. One, um, we have to always remember that uh, the First Amendment um, is a limit on government uh, action to uh, restrict speech. So social media companies are not subject uh, to the restrictions of the First Amendment. However, they have First Amendment rights themselves to express um, their editorial point of view, just the way the New York Times has a right um, to have uh, op-eds or, or whatever um, media organization you want to talk about. And we would be very concerned concerned about laws that said um, that they weren't allowed to, um, you know, restrict, um, you know, what kind of content gets into their um, media entities. So I am, I am, uh, I am disturbed by um, and worried about um, these types of laws. However, they're, they're clearly unconstitutional. And what's interesting uh, about the liberal uh, left and right dynamic um, is that it's the, the conservative members of the court um, who have in the past said that there is no state action um, involved uh, when you have people taking on quasi-government roles. There was a case called Manhattan Access versus Halleck a number of years ago, um, or not that many years ago, like four or five years ago, um, which split down on um, five, four uh, lines with the conservatives all saying that a cable access company um, was not a government actor, even though um, it had been sort of licensed by the city of New York. Um, so it's conservatives in the past who say that um, other organizations are not like government actors, even if they have a quasi government function. Um, and, and I think that what's so strange and interesting about um, the court um, in the Supreme Court in terms of um, political ideology is that the First Amendment has very strange bedfellows. Uh, both uh, in the past, it's been championed um, by more liberal members like Justice Marshall. Um, uh, and then today we have Justice Roberts who considers himself the foremost uh, champion of the First Amendment. I, I often quibble with whether he's quite as strong a defender as he thinks he is, um, but that just goes to show that um, traditional party ideologies don't play out the way you might expect when it comes to the First Amendment. Um, and so that makes me more confident um, that any of these kind of cases that uh, did go all the way up to the Supreme Court would be uh, struck down as they should be. Ian, yeah, Mike, before I turn things back over to Brad, I'm going to um, indulge myself and ask the question that I always like to ask authors, uh, fellow writers. You have a full time job and you teach. Uh, how do you find the time to write and what is your process? Uh, well, I can go first. Um, uh, I stay up very late. Um, that has uh, always been the secret of my um, ability to get stuff done. Uh, Nightline usually finishes around midnight and um, I uh, my review for them um, and I get my best writing done between uh, midnight and sort of 2.30, 3 a.m. Uh, so um, it's worked for me so far. Um, the other way is I have an incredibly supportive family that um, makes that kind of thing possible. So um, they let me sleep in among other things. I think you turned that script around pretty fast. Well, we have uh, right yeah, from... I wrote it. I wrote it in about a year. Um, so oh, uh, really, yeah, okay. So yeah. I, I really want to. I still think that's fast. Right. You don't think that's fast? <laughs> no, it's, I it's fast. Questions. But I, I really want to get to this question, and, I, and then I'll turn it. I promise, Brad, I'll turn it back to you. But uh, this is uh, one last question: What do all the niceties of free speech mean when Assange, Snowden, and Manning, to mention only three instances, are persecuted in plain sight? I thought that would be a really good one for you, and I know it's in the book. So uh, it is in the book. Um, you got uh, the the Pentagon Papers uh, chapter talks a lot about uh, leakers and whistleblowers. Um, um, and one of the other reoccurring themes, besides protecting the uh, dissent, besides defending the press, um, I would say is that freedom of speech does not mean freedom from consequences. 
So people may have a free speech right um, to express uh, their viewpoints, um, but that does not mean that they then have a legal right um, to be protected um, even from criminal prosecution. Um, Daniel Ellsberg was criminally prosecuted even after the Times was vindicated um, and allowed to publish um, the Pentagon Papers document that he leaked. But even in more broad uh, context, people suffer um, you know, really terrible um, circumstances um, for the right to speak. Mary Beth Tinker, a, you know, a school uh, kid um, had death threats. Um, and uh, so, you know, for, for good and ill, um, freedom of speech does not mean that you are in some kind of protected bubble once you um, speak those um, protected words. I was trying to hold up because someone was just asking who clearly arrived late um, about whether there were any images I could show. So um, here are some more images. Brad, I turn things back to you. Thank you so much. And I have so many questions. I love talking to you. I miss talking with you, but sure. we'll catch up. Thank you so much. And Mike, fa fantastic to hear how you did it and, um, and Thank how you, you were. Yeah, great moderating, uh, Laura and, and Ian and Mike. You know, For all my own years as, as a journalist, which was my previous career for, for three decades, you know, I never thought of the First Amendment in visual terms. Hmm. So, so I was fascinated to, to see, not just read, what you did. It, it really, really works for me and definitely helps bring free speech principles more to life. Thank um, you. To thank everyone you. watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing copies of Free Speech uh, Handbook. And another reminder that we do at, at Politics and Pros have signed and illustrated book plates uh, if you get the book through us. From all of us here at Politics and Pros, stay well and well